Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Database Decision Making for Small and we Medium Web Development Agencies. So normally I would introduce myself and my company, but I need all the time today, so we're going to jump right in. This is a lot of information. My slides um, and all of my speaker notes will be shared online. I only have 30 minutes, so I can't speak as slowly as I would like, uh, but don't worry, everything I say is written down. You can read it later. I will also share all of the spreadsheets and all of the tools that I talk about today. Also, if you have another way of doing these things at your company that you'd like to share, please feel free during the Q&A. I have been doing this for 23 years, but I certainly don't know everything, and I would love to improve things at my company too, so I would love to hear your experiences. This, does this sound weird to you guys, or it's fine? Okay. So today we're going to talk about how to use data generated by your work to decide how to manage your business. And in the title, I say it's focused on small and medium businesses. The advice really applies to all web development firms. The difference is really that as we get bigger and our revenue grows, we tend to purchase more software as a service to um, collect this data and help us make decisions. So some of the techniques I talk about can really be outsourced to software when you can afford it. You have to figure out at what point saving time is worth spending money. So, in surveys that I've seen, about a third of US companies are not using any services for issue tracking, project management, capacity planning, and even accounting. And US companies tend to be pretty big. So I thought it would be good to share some of the solutions we have found or built ourselves that don't require a subscription. Why are we talking about data-driven decisions? What's the point? So typically our goal is to increase profit. This may sound obvious, but growing your business, taking on more clients, building more sites is not really a good way to measure business success. We don't really care about the money we make as much as the money we get to keep. So for example, one company can work 100 hours, make 100,000 baht, and have 10,000 baht profit. Or you can work 1,000 hours, make a million baht, and still only have that same 10,000 baht profit. We want to be the first company. We want to work less time for our money and I want to make sure you know how to control the profit you get for the time you're putting in, for the work you're putting in. So to do that, we need some data. So we're going to cover um, business decisions about your finances. How much should you charge your clients? How do you know which of your clients are profitable? Workflow, how many projects can you do? When can you do, do them? How can you set deadlines? And estimates, how long is the work going to take? No one knows, uh, but sometimes we have to guess anyway. And these things are all connected. We need to do estimates to know our workflow. We need to know workflow to do staffing. We need to know financial to basically do anything at all. So I left estimates for last because I could do an entire presentation on that, and I think I have. Um, but we need to know all of this stuff so we can set our prices and control the amount of work we do for each of the clients. And those are the factors that determine profitability. So let's dive into finances first. One of the most important decisions as a company is how much to charge your clients. That's a big factor in how much money you make. So we know that revenue minus expenses is your profit. But even if you're charging clients by the project, by story points, by the month, by the page, whatever, at the end of the day, you're paying employees for their time and you're charging clients for your employees' time. So it does basically come down to hours no matter what kind of engagement you have. And it also helps us do our math later. So we want to know what profit per hour so we can know how much to charge clients generally and whether each individual client is profitable. So first we need to find our company's total expenses for the year. And it's up to you how you want to average your expenses. You can calculate this once per year and adjust your rates. You can use a rolling average. So at any point you can say what, how much of our expenses been in the past 12 months. You can guess ahead to next month's next year's budget and do it based on that. Your expenses are all the things you spend money on as a company. So salaries, benefits, rent, subscriptions, hardware, hosting, if you pay for it as a company, it's an expense. Then we need your billable hours. These are only the hours that the clients are actually paying for. Once we have our expenses and our billable hours as a company, we can divide total company expenses by total company billable hours. This is our break-even hourly rate. 
This is how much we need to charge for every hour that we bill in order to exactly pay our expenses. This is one of the most important numbers we have in our business and it's the basis for our pricing decisions. So obviously it's really hard to know exactly how much your expenses are gonna be or how many hours of billable time you're gonna have across your company. Um, so we add more to each hour to make sure we can pay our expenses and also make a profit. So uh, you, you can decide how much to charge clients by deciding how much profit you want to make. The profit margin is the amount of money that you get to keep above the amount you need to pay your expenses. So this is the money you get to keep if you're the owner of the company. Or you can use it to upgrade equipment, give raises, give bonuses, or other investment back in your company. So in this example, we want to make 20% profit. So we'll take our break-even made-up hourly rate of 1,000 baht and increase it by 20%. So that's the money we can keep after we pay our expenses. You can also work the math backwards if you have a profit goal in mind. So let's say we want to make a million baht next year. If my expenses are five million, I need to bring in six million in order for my profit to be one million. That would give me a profit margin of 16.7% and a sales goal of six million baht. Okay, easy. Now, looking at how much we have to charge per hour to make one million baht in profit. We know our expenses are five million, Let's say our billable hours are 10,000 hours. That is probably around six or seven people working full time for a year. We have to charge 500 baht per hour to pay our expenses. To keep 1 million baht in profit, we know our revenue goal is 6 million, so we would have to charge clients 600 baht per hour to keep 1 million baht in profit. Okay, so that is the basis. If you're a really small company or you don't do time tracking for whatever reason, you can guess at your billable hours. Um, so you start with the standard working hours in your country. In America, it's 2,080. You subtract some estimates for non-billable time, and you use that as a guess for each employee's billable hours. So looking at my company's actual billable hours for the past five years, we were like 67, 58, 61, 55, 52. So 59% billable on average, but it does change year to year. So sometime, some years we're doing a lot of conferences, working on our internal site or our internal products. We have people going on parental leave or other types of non-billable time. So it's good to take an average and think about how plans in the coming year might affect your billable hours. We also really wanna know if each client is profitable. So you will have some clients who um, argue over hours, ask for, ask for estimates that they never approve, you have to work on a technology you're not an expert with, um, and you can't really bill them for all of it, or they just find other ways to make you spend time on them that you can't bill them. Um, if, you're, if your clients are paying for all of the time you spend on them, you are winning. You are doing a great job. You are a hero. Um, if you find that you're spending a lot of non-billable time on a particular client, you may need to increase their rates to make up for it. So these are just some example rates but you wanna have a scale in mind for how much you will charge in different situations. Typically, you will charge the most if a client has a very small project, they only need a few hours of work, or if they're high maintenance. So these are the clients where you spend a lot of internal time compared to the amount of time that you're billing them. And it usually makes sense to reduce the cost per hour according to how much total money they're gonna give you. So if it's a large retainer or a build, usually that means you can charge less per hour and still make a good profit. You may want to reduce your rates for very large projects, for companies that you want to help, like you care about their mission, um, or in situations where your staff doesn't have a lot of work and they're not going to be doing anything anyway, so it makes sense to take less profitable projects just to fill their time. I found this chart I made in 2013, and it's called Chart of How Much We Like Our Clients. This was a joke but I was trying to make a point to our client services team that we have a lot of clients where we do a lot of work but make a low profit, and we have other clients where we do a little work but we make a lot of profit. So um, keep in mind that we do need revenue to pay our expenses, so sometimes we still want those clients who give us a lot of revenue without a lot of profit. But you need to know that's happening. You need to be in control of how much time you're spending on these clients for how much money you're getting. So we currently use a sheet like this to track revenue changes by client, both by quarter and over years. 
Um, and we use this to see how our client revenue and business line revenue are changing over time. I made a template for you. It's at that URL on all of these spreadsheets and all of the templates I made are in my speaker notes as well, which I will share um, when it's posted online. This is another profitability sheet and this gets more granular by client. So each client has a row and I track their actual hours versus our revenue to see what we would have to charge to break even, what we are actually making per hour and what our profit and our profit margin are. So you can see I do this for retainer clients, hourly clients and projects which are our builds. So I do this every quarter and then I make another sheet for the year, keeping previous year totals to compare. So this shows you how much you're really making on each client and will clearly show you which clients are not being charged enough for the work that you're doing. Now we know how much to charge for work. If our prices are calculated well, the more work we do, the more money we make. But we do have a limited number of developer hours available, so we have to figure out how many projects we can do and when we can do them. The first thing you need to figure out is what resources you need for the project, and that starts with doing an estimate, which we'll also talk about later. And this can be organized based on the size of the project, by story points, by hours, by weeks, by sprints. Once you know how much time the project will take, you can look at your project schedule to see where you can fit it in. And depending on your company, you may have to plan multiple team schedules or you just the teams that are really busy. So for me, I have to really carefully keep track of our front and back end developers, but like project managers, design, IT, their schedules are usually fine. Um, so you need some kind of project schedule. For large companies, we're talking about Gantt charts. They let us map our workflow over time and by resource, since we typically have agile teams that are working together long term. For small to medium companies, you can make your own resource planner with Google Sheets or Excel. You can use software um, like Jira integrations, Harvest Forecast, Monday.com, Resource Guru, which is what I use, and tons of other software services that let you visualize the work that you have planned for your company. So I found this old spreadsheet also from 2013, um, when I love spreadsheets, to keep track of our maintenance work, so our non-build tickets. And this was when we used Basecamp as our project management tool. Now we use Jira, so I have custom filters set up to do this. But if you're a small company, you can do something like this to allocate your build resources if you don't want to pay for a software subscription for resource tracking. So as we book work or we move through the sales process for work that's not booked yet, I put it into the sheet according to our team's internal estimate. When we have a new project coming, I can scroll forward in time until I see an opening for the resources that I expect to need. So if a client asks to have a site improvement done in two weeks, but I see that we're fully booked, I can ask the client to move the deadline, I can get in touch with our outsourcing partners to ask them if they have availability to help, um, or I can tell the client that we just can't you know, handle the work for them. So once we see our potential start date, we can go back to our estimated resource needs and figure out what the deadline would look like if everything went perfectly, our estimate was 100% accurate and nothing went wrong in the entire build. And then we take that deadline that will never happen and we fig figure in real life. So depending on how close to reality your team's estimates tend to be and how complex the project is, you want to increase your estimate by some margin, so somewhere, usually somewhere between 20 and 300%. Um, please do not book your developers for eight hours in an eight-hour workday. There will be some days when people can or have to code the entire day, but that's really not realistic as a guideline. It's not way, a good way to do a schedule. So we use five to seven hours per day of output depending on the complexity of the project, how well they know the underlying technology, whether they've worked on that site before, and how dedicated the developer is to that project. If you have them switching between different types of work, you can expect their output to go down for sure. Um, I also find that we tend to estimate, underestimate the time needed to do final QA of beta sites, as well as the final edits and the small scope creep driven by clients. So if you don't add that time into your schedule, it's going to cause major problems for the start time of the next project that you have booked for those resources. Obviously, if it's a major scope creep, that work needs to be flagged as such for the client and scheduled the way any new work is scheduled. 
So if you are a dev company that's not 100% retainer driven, it is very hard to know how much work your company will have. Emergencies come up, estimates go bad, clients have new ideas. We rely heavily on freelancers and outsourcing work to other dev firms that helps us handle overflow. We do sometimes have to tell clients we just can't do it, but we try to partner with other companies who might have resources free to handle that overflow work. So if you want to do that, try to find those resources, try to find those partners before you need them. Do a test project, get to know each other, make sure they work with your workflow and you guys can trust each other, and then you know who to turn to when you, when you need help. First of all, it is not your team that is bad at estimates. It is not developers who are bad at estimates. Human beings are really, really bad at estimates. We are bad at estimating everything. Literally, someone won the Nobel Prize proving that. So a survey by the Project Management Institute showed only about half of their members' projects are completed on time and on budget, and that's better than a lot of stats I've seen. Obviously, the easiest, most accurate, and most profitable approach is to build with Agile on a time and materials basis. Like, it's awesome if the client just pays for all of the time that you work. Um, but a lot of clients need that upfront pricing, even if it's like, um, you know, maximum price, or they don't understand Agile methods at all. So what can we do to make estimates better when we have to do them? This template is open source and is linked to my slide notes. Uh, before you work on an estimate for a new proje project, you need to decide whether it's even worth doing the project at all. So is it a good fit for the technologies that your company uses? Do you have the staff available for it? Is it a good client or work that you're excited to do? You can fill this out yourself, or as we do have a few people on different teams give their opinions and see if the work even makes sense in the first place. Most companies need to be selective about the work they pursue in order to avoid overextending your team or also getting into projects that are just a terrible fit for your company. If we decide to take on a new project, we normally give the client some kind of estimate, even if it's a range or a do not exceed price. Since our developers don't know the future, it can help to look at the past. So just like you can use reference stories to create a basis for story points, you can find previous projects that your team worked on that's similar to the new project and use the time you spent on those to give you an idea of the range to expect. If you don't use a time tracking tool that gives you a historical reference, that profitability tracking sheet we looked at actually does provide a record of that time. So the most important step in improving estimates is to break the work down. This only works if you have decent specs for the project. If you don't have specs, please do not expect your developers to give you accurate estimates. When a project's not defined, we tell the client that we can't do an accurate estimate with the information that we have. So we give them a range of what we think the project might end up in, you know, thinking about other similar projects we've done in the past, but we tell them that we may need to change that if the, when the project becomes more defined and we actually know what work we're gonna do. If we have good specs, we can start breaking the work down. So obviously if it's a single task, you can write a user story and the developer can estimate in story points. When things get larger, we use templates to help break down tasks and also keep in mind the non-story work that needs to be done. So this is our story points template. We use this for requests that are less than one sprint of work, which for us is two weeks. The first sheet is the summary sheet. So this creates totals for all of the tabs at the bottom. You can add as many tabs as you need for the work you're doing. Just make sure to edit the summary page to include all the new tabs so that your totals are correct. So here we have tabs by a type of work. Um, you can also add tabs for any work that you want to estimate separately. So if there's, you can give the client options as to what work they want to buy. It helps them decide what features they can develop for their budget. As we discussed earlier, even if you work in sprints or story points, many clients pay in hours with their retainers. You pay your employees for the hours they work, more or less, even if they're on salary. So ultimately, hours are pretty closely tied to pricing no matter how you work. This is the system we use to convert points to hours. You can develop your own table that makes sense for your team. 
Our rule is that anything over eight points need to be broken down into smaller stories, and we don't put anything over eight into estimates. Um, but this is the math that's powering that story point spreadsheet. If your client understands what 950 story points means, then you do not need this. You don't need to convert into hours. Um, but most small and medium agencies are not dealing with the type of client who can understand that. Um, so if we go back to the summary sheet, when each team member fills in the separate tab, the homepage converts the story points into hours. It then uses the hourly rate that we want to charge for our project to create a price range that we can give to the client. And I also included, oh no, sorry, a little bit later. So looking at one of the tabs, we use the top section, we have a pre-filled list of common tasks. And this is to help our team not forget work that is not coding. So they might want to talk, they might want to include time for meetings, planning, deployment, and just other things that we don't think about when we're planning these features out. Um, then the bottom section can be short, like this, if the work is simple, or you can include as many lines of user stories as you want if the work is complex. And you can see that we only have options for one, three, five, or eight story points so that nobody can put anything bigger than that in there. Mm. So I included this older sheet because um, it shows, this is about eight years ago, um, when government clients used to make us create sites that were backwards compatible to old versions of IE, that was a good time, uh, when responsive was something that clients paid for instead of the default way to build sites, and when we charged extra for creating style guides or we didn't do it at all. So, but this gives you an option to add extra add-ons for pricing for things that, you're, that you don't typically include in a build. You can just add them in a separate area and it sums it up from the other sheets. Um, and then this one also has, so it has a break even price, a proposed, what we would normally charge, and then it has a premium, um, and that's for clients who are rushing us, who are making us do something that's kind of out of our wheelhouse, not something we're good at, or whatever reason we want to overcharge them. Um, so here's an example template that estimates simple tasks, but lets us add a pain in the ass, like what, what factor, for clients or projects that are difficult. In this example, the hours came out to 3.5, but the estimate is 7. There's a doubling of time for expected complications, and this is useful if you are starting to build in a, in a technology that your team is not familiar with, if the client is really bureaucratic, so for instance, dealing with government or big universities, sometimes there's really a lot of overhead piled on the actual things you're building. Um, so this will help you adjust your estimates and hours or story points and calculate different pricing tiers based on that. So if the work is at least one sprint of work, we, instead of that story points template, we use the sprint estimate template. So each person estimates the number of sprints they will need to work to complete the project. Note that you can adjust utilization or sprints, like 50% utilization for two sprints is the same as 100% utilization for one sprint. So make sure to tell your team if that difference is how you're planning the sprint out. Um, so they know whether it matters. Then you just adjust, adjust the project values to how much you want to charge per hour, how many weeks are in your sprints, how many hours there are in a week for your developers, which is not every hour that your company is open, and if you want to add a flat project rate management fee on top. So for your PMs, you can add a certain percent, or you can add separate lines for your PMs, BAs, whatever you have. As with our other template, we can add tabs at the bottom to estimate out different features separately as you need. Um, you can also see in our version that I link to our tracker for historical project hours. So that way everybody who goes to make an estimate can look at all of the real project hours that we spent on every build we've ever done for 20 years. So those are the templates we use to do estimates, but I wanted to share a few other tips to help increase estimate accuracy. Um, estimate work for other people. Believe it or not, we do more accurate estimates if we imagine another person is going to be doing the work. So if you're the one doing it, imagine some other developer who has your same job is going to be doing that work and you will create a more accurate estimate. Um, use past projects as a guide. 
add that buffer time, and also think about worst case situations. In reality, most projects turn out longer than we thought was even possible. Okay, let us wrap this up. So in summary, collect data, use it to make business decisions and profits. Thank you all for coming, I really appreciate it. And ขอบคุณที่คนช่วยเอวี